welcome to Getaway Day. As always, I am Mason. He is Thomas Rat. We are here to talk some baseball. There are a few things that you may notice are a little bit different today. Me being on this side of the screen, him not being Gautham, the fact that we're actually live this week. Like there, there's a lot of new stuff right now. Uh, things have been a little bit hectic in both Gautham and I's personal lives here just the last couple of weeks with illnesses and work and a whole bunch of different stuff. So it's been a little hard for us to get content out as normal. T-Rad has been wonderful in uh, coming on camera, recording some episodes with me offline on not normal stream days. And today we were finally able to get it done on stream day and still have T-Rad join us. So for everyone who is watching us record live, they are getting to either meet T-Rad or see him in person live for the first time ever. So uh, congrats to you guys. Um, but yeah, so we have a lot of baseball to talk about this week. Um, but before that, I guess, T-Rad, how are you doing, bud? I'm doing pretty good. Uh, you know, had a nice 307 getaway day uh, game over here with the Jays and Yankees. Unfortunately, Eric Swanson forgot how to pitch. And uh, so did Tim Mesa. So we ended up giving up a 4-1, uh, yeah, 4-1 lead and lost 6-4. But overall, we took two of three against the Yankees, and I will make sure that DZ and uh, Rachel, who are both in the chat right now, will never live that down. Well, uh, I would just like to remind you, they are three games up in the standings, so... I would just like to remind you that I do not care. Well, fair enough. Um, <laughs> but the Yankees are starting out hot this year. 13 and 6. The Guardians, 12 and 5. The uh, Braves, 12 and 5. We have quite a few really good teams so far that have kind of stood out. Some of them we expected, some of them maybe not as much um, to be this hot this early. Uh, but we've had a couple teams who we kind of expected to be at the bottom. Our expectations for them coming into the season were low like is, is, really, is it really is it flow rider that does get low I, th I think so yeah like that's how low we're talking uh we're, we're talking like we're, we were we're talking like depths of where the titanic is low ah farther than that like, well, I was going to go Mariana's Trench, but I feel like that's where they where these teams currently the, are. Have you ever seen the movie Journey to the Center of the Earth? Yes. They're Great most movie. of the way down. They're almost there. Yeah, they're almost there. Um, but yeah, we've had some really, really, really bad starts. And I was curious to see where they stacked up historically. And coming into the season, I think the teams we expected to be here at the very bottom of the league with the worst starts were probably number one, the Oakland days, right? I, I would. Yeah. Yeah. Guess who's not in this list. Guess who's not the even Oakland in last days. place in their division. The, the Oakland, Oakland days. days. Uh, I think we expected the Washington nationals to be down here. Guess who's not in last place in their division. The and Washington only, nationals. Yep. So I feel like there's one team, though, that we expected to be on this list that actually is on this list. So, yeah. So the Chicago White Sox were probably the other team that everyone was like, yep, they're going to suck. No, I was thinking the Colorado Rockies. Uh, the expectations for the White Sox coming into this year were to be possibly worse than the A's. Oh, no, I, I'm just messing with you. I fully uh, expect the White Sox to be completely horrendous. And so but, far, we're right. Uh, the White Sox have started the season going 3-15 and 15 through their first 18 games. The Colorado Rockies, the aforementioned Colorado Rockies, are 4-14. Four and 14. The Miami Marlins are also 4-14. and 14. Um, So I was kind of curious to see how that stacked up historically. And luckily for me... I have uh, access to StatHead, which we're not sponsored by StatHead, uh, but it's an yeah. amazing tool. Um, 
basically you could go in and search a whole bunch of different criteria and come up with a whole bunch of like these really uh intricate stats like anything that sarah lang's tweets that you're like that's a ridiculous stat how did she come up with that she used a stat head she's actually the one who kind of recommended that i use it so um pretty sure when it comes to stats uh sarah lang's basically is the engine that runs stat head i think so too yeah stat head if you're uh baseball reference slash stat head if you're listening uh we would gladly talk about you more uh for you know free stat head and maybe a little more um but yeah so i went through i looked at the worst starts since 1961 when the roster or when, not when the roster when the schedule was expanded to 162 games um to see the worst starts in history uh since 1900 there have been 80 teams that have started 14 or 4 and 14 or worse to begin a season since 1961 when we went to 162 games it's been 44 teams so starting this bad is not common but it's not uncommon some of these teams are in some weird seasons like the covid bubble season some of them are um uh some of them were during the 1994 and uh strike shortened season in the 1995 season as well um but a lot of them have been in normal seasons uh with that being said Things don't typically go well if you start 4 and 14. And if you start worse than that, things get really bad. Uh, out of those 44 teams, three of them have completed the season with a 500 record. One of them has made the postseason. And that was the 1973 Cardinals, who started 3 and 15. So Chicago White Sox fans. Basically, what I'm saying is there's still, still a, chance. Have a chance. So you're so, telling me there's a chance. I am telling you there's a chance. So all hope is not lost yet. The worst Until start in Major League history, by the way, just for fun fact, 1988 Baltimore Orioles started 0 in 18. Ew. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's so, a new. Yeah, it was not a good, not a good year. So. But yeah, so I guess before we get a little deeper into this, T-Red, thoughts on some of these bad starts, the numbers here? Like, I'm, I, I look at the White Sox, and as much as we expected them to be bad, we expect them to be worse than Oakland bad. Well, like, they've I, also just been riddled by injuries, too. I, I don't, I don't want to skip ahead. I'm, I'm kind of talking right now more generally. Um, yeah, not, not, just, not the specific... Yeah, these three I'm, teams. I'm just looking like I'm I'm just talking generally the White Sox losing guys like Luis Robert, who really was like the price by that team. But like just in general, I don't. Like, it's hard to say, like, oh, you know, these teams are doomed, but if a team like the Yankees started three and 15 with the team they have, I don't think anyone would blink an eye at it because it's still you're just over 10 percent of the way through the season now at 18 games in but a team like the like the teams that we have on this list you feel a bit more like a hopeless feeling for like the fans of that team just because of the way those teams are constructed but if it was a team like if the baltimore orioles came out and started three and 15 i don't think anyone would blink an eye if the Dodgers started three and fifteen, people would be like, "Okay, this is a little concerning," but they'd be like, "This team has Shohei Otani, we'll be fine." So that's kind of like my general thoughts of it: is we still have ninety percent of the season left to go. If and obviously the rosters of the really bad teams are not major league caliber, to be completely honest with you. But overall, I think there is not a lot of optimism from the fan bases right now. Yeah. And it's, it's one of those that like, it's, uh, you have to have the perfect storm of things going wrong for your club to start this poorly, this early. I mean, we're seeing clubs like the, um, 
like the A's, who by the end of the season, I fully expect to be 20 games below 500, maybe at best. Probably at yeah. best. Um, but, like, it, even with teams like the White Sox that had pretty low expectations, with the Rockies, who have constantly low expectations, the Marlins are a team that made the postseason last year. Like, that's a team that you're... It, maybe they're not the best team in the world, but it, it does surprise you whenever things like this happen. And so, like, what what's the... My next thing that I looked at was like, what is happening here? Just at a very base level, run scored, runs given up. Where's the problem for these three teams? And I have the numbers here. The White Sox with a three and 15 record have scored 34 runs in 18 games. That is less than two runs per game. I'm going to go back to my uh, analysis from earlier. Ew. Appreciate that. Um, on the flip side, the White Sox have only given up 87 runs, 74 of those earned. So there's been quite a few errors there giving up unearned runs. I mean, 13 unearned runs is, is a lot. Um, so it look just without going any deeper into the stats, it looks like there's clearly a hitting problem. There's definitely a bit of a defensive issue. But in general, you could say that maybe the pitching staff isn't the weak point of this club. The Marlins, on the other hand, have scored over twice as many runs as the White Sox. They've scored 69 runs. Nice. Which is nice. That is yeah. nice. Uh, but they've given up 95. And 82 of those being earned. So again, 13 unearned runs. The Rockies have scored 70 runs, but they have given up 103 runs. So, like, the, the run differentials here for these clubs, I mean, we're at, what, 53, or minus 53 for the White Sox already. We're at uh, minus 26 for the Marlins and minus 33 for the Rockies. But the White Sox seems to be a hitting issue, whereas the other two seem to be a pitching issue. And with the Marlins, too, they had that really, really good starter. Max Meyer started the year two and one, which considering the fact that the Marlins only have two win, uh, four wins, he has half their wins and they sent him down to triple A. They sent him down after his best start as well, um, yeah. which part of it from what they're saying publicly is that it is in an effort to limit his innings. I don't know how that works because extra off days in the majors are going to work the same as extra off days in the minors. It, it so, doesn't make sense. It's like, it's, it's kind of a BS excuse, but at the same time, uh, eh, they're not playing for anything right no. now. They, they've already voided skip Schumacher's, um, his option on his contract and he took them to the postseason in his first year as manager. So like I, I, I struggle to see what this club's doing because you can't make it to the playoffs with a crap roster, give another crap roster. It starts out horribly and then you go, Oh, it's the manager's fault. Yeah. I, I honestly don't understand kind of in general what the Miami Marlins are doing. Um, just in the pure, like, you know, obviously they don't have guys like Sandy Alcantara. They don't have, uh, Yuri Perez. Um, but I think we get to that later on, but just like, there's nothing going on that's positive to say like, Hey, you know, they're scoring runs. That's great. Their pitching cannot stop runs from scoring. So it's like, you know, you look at a guy like Jazz Chisholm or Luisa, Luisa Rise, like guys that are so good that just like Luisa Rise, I like batting title back to back years. It's like the offense is not the problem, but I feel like there's. And this is where the analytics come in with it, too, where everyone's like pitching and defense wins championships. You lose the pitching part. 
you don't have necessarily the best defense part, that offense can't outscore your problems. Yeah, I'm pulling up a couple of numbers here, but like Luis Arise is hitting. Oh, whoops. What did I just do? Uh, Luis Arise is hitting um, like 292. He's he's almost back up to 300 after a really rough start in the first week where I think he had maybe one hit in the first week. And then he's been going three for four or four for whatever and and getting back to his thing. Uh, his OBP is 370, so he's getting on base. You got Jazz over here who's hitting 242 um, with a 338 OBP, so he's taking a pretty good number of walks, two home runs. He's really not been that great of a hitter overall, though. Like, he's still grayed out or grades out at a 100 WRC+. Plus. Josh Bell has been bad. Like... 212, 316, two homers, 88 WRC plus. He's not even a very good defensive first baseman. So like I'm a little bit confused as to like where the where the positives on their offense are still. Because like Brian De La Cruz is not that guy. He's he's a, a fine player, but he's not a slugger. He's not like this insane uh, OBP guy. He's babbipping like crazy right now. So his 276 av- or average is being floated by a 352 babbip. He's only walked 1% of the time. Like, so I-, I guess I don't know. I haven't seen like a consistent team approach on the hitting side from this club yet. No, I mean, and we're obviously. We haven't included Jake Berger, who still wasn't hitting great at 228 average, but three home runs, 15 RBIs. Like he was doing decent enough to be okay. Actually, Brian De La Cruz uh, hitting 288. So, I mean, still not horrible, but it's just the rest of the guys. Like it takes a massive dip from the top of the, um, like just at batting average leaders on the Marlins. It goes from 288 at Brian De La Cruz, 276 for Luisa Rise, 267 for Tim Anderson. The fourth is Jazz Chisholm at 231. This is according to uh, MLB.com. So, okay. And then so, 228 for Jake Berger, and then 200 for Josh Bell. So, Nick Gordon has been probably the best hitter on this club. Three home runs, a 548 slug. Compared to his average, his 286 OBP is really good, and the dude's got some speed. So he's been able to make some stuff happen for um, for the Marlins. But, like, the rest of this lineup, just, they're okay. Like, let's see, even, let me just do it this way. If I sc- sort the... So there are only one, two, three, four, five. There are only six teams that have scored less runs than the Marlins. Like, the fact that their issue is with pitching and not with hitting, and that's how they've got to four and 14 is kind of surprising because they're not, they're not hitting either. But, like, nothing about this club is screaming, oh, my God, things are going to turn around. Now, some of their issues have been injuries. Sandy Alcantara, still on the 60-day IL. Yuri Perez went down and is getting Tommy John, so he's out for the season. Braxton Garrett had a shoulder impingement, so he's out. Um, In their bullpen, JT Chargois, Josh Simpson, on the position player side, Christian Bethencourt, Jake Berger. So a lot of regulars for this club are on the aisle. And it, having, it feels like it feels like the bulk of major leaguers at this point are on the aisle. That is accurate. Yeah. So, but I don't know. It's it's one of those that I guess this is just showing that one, the players who were there before they got hurt were struggling. 
I don't think there's any way to uh, uh, refute that point. They were struggling. They're better than they've been playing for sure. Um, but now you're losing the key pieces and they don't have the depth to make up for it. Like they're at the point where their bench guys are, are starting every day. They're Jesus Sanchez, they're Emmanuel Rivera. Um, now they've got uh, Johnny Pereira and Otto Lopez on the bench. Vidal Brujan, who's not really shown anything, any, yeah, he's not shown his abilities at the major league level yet. Um, even though he's been given to this point in Tampa some decent opportunities, he just hasn't been able to take advantage of it. So the depth for this club is just not there. It's, and, and it's then really you send not. down Max Meyer. And Max and Meyer is is very much the bright spot. Yeah, and club. then you have, like, you look at the rotation too, it's like, you're still trying to rely on AJ Puck to get an out and he's 0-3 with a 5.91 ERA. Like for a guy that and I know uh Gautham touched on it last week in his uh in his this week in baseball. Like AJ Puck, they were he had a phenomenal spring training, and then he goes up to the bright lights of the regular season and he just cannot get an out at this point. In three starts, he's only gone ten and two thirds innings. Yikes! You no. don't want to use my analysis from earlier, you? No, I have to use yikes because that's your thing. I can't take your bit. Okay, um, that's fair. But just I I want to close on the Marlins with a bright spot. So let's let's just kind of close with Max Meyer because he will be back up on this club whenever they figure out what the hell they're doing with this whole monitoring his innings and trying to keep him fresh for the whole year. You could do that in a major league clubhouse. You don't have to send him down. But through three starts, Max Meyer has gone 17 innings. So what is that? Five and a third innings on average per game. He has struck out 20% of batters, which is lower than what he has done in the minors, but it's a, a fairly good start considering that he's actually pitching well this year. He's cut his walk rate down to 4.6% so far. He, or opponents are only hitting 180 off of him and he's got a 212 ERA. So if you pitch behind Max Meyer once every five days or play behind Max Meyer once every five days, you're giving yourself a chance to go and win 30 games right there. I was about to cut you off because we just need to monitor your word count. Just so you know. Oh, OK. Uh, you should just send me back to the. I don't know what the minor leagues would be for this podcast. <laughs> Discord? I don't know. Yeah, I'll, I'll send you to uh, to our backup recording studio. <laughs> All right, but but no, I I do like Max Meyer. I think once he monitors his innings enough in AAA, which I still don't understand, but we've talked about that till we're, we could talk about that till we're blue in the face. Which for a team like the Marlins with their primary color being blue, I feel like we shouldn't do that. I don't know if you've seen my skin tone. If I go blue in the face, I'm just going to be purple. My my face is always red. Well, I mean, their jerseys, they kind of look purple sometimes when they go and throw like the black with the red and the blue. It just kind of looks strange. All right, so let's uh, let's go talk about our playoff hopefuls for a little bit. So I'm down. So the White Sox, as I mentioned a little while ago, their main problem, their biggest problem, is that they have scored the least runs in the major leagues. Through today's games, they have scored 38 runs. I think in my sheet here, I had 34. So they they scored four today. Cool. Uh, I believe that that is two games today, though. Yes. Yeah. So they're still averaging. The second game was only two to one. They're still so. averaging two runs per game. Um, I, I, it is being pointed out to me the White Sox' biggest problem is Jerry Reinsdorf, which is correct. But given the framework that we've been provided by Jerry Reinsdorf, their biggest problem is hitting. Uh, and like 
I, I, I'm so confused by this club because there are some good hitters on this team. Number one, Luis Robert. He's amazing. He was, uh, in, he got MVP votes last year. He very much deserved them, but he is on the IL with a strained, a strained hip flexor and has been since the sixth. There's, I guess, second best hitter. Second best hitter would be Aloy, I guess, right? Um, which I would Aloy, think so. Aloy did just come back from injury, but he's been out basically until like yesterday, I think. No, he's played two games. Uh, it was yeah, no, he, Monday, he was activated today okay. and played both games of the doubleheader. But no, he was on the was, IL Sunday. He was activated before that. I think he was activated Monday. Well, he, he was activated for the game yesterday that got rained out. So his first game well, back was today. I think his first full game back was today. I'm pretty sure he had a pinch hit appearance on Monday. Mm-hmm. And he struck out. If oh, I remember okay. correctly. Gotcha. This Again, is... I could be I could be completely wrong, but I'm pretty sure. Oh, okay. Sorry, the the thing on roster resource I just realized is only showing if they're in the starting lineup. So because yeah, it's was, the he... it's the last six lineups position lineup spot. So I think if you yeah, come in and really hit or yeah. He pinch hit in the ninth on Jackie Robinson Day and struck out to end the game. Okay. So I was misreading this uh, this little table here. Um, also, looking right now, uh, Dominic Fletcher has also been pretty good for the White Sox, all things considered. I mean, only a two thirty four average, but I mean for the for the White Sox, honestly, at this point, you kind of take that. Yeah, and um, I, I'm not saying there's no positives here, but the I think the biggest thing that I'm trying to get across is the three guys that they're expecting to rely on to be the heart of their order, and Luis Robert. Aloy Jimenez and Yoan Moncada have all been hurt and missed some significant time already. Um, those are the three guys that have the most power in this lineup. And a lot of teams rely on power to get their runs now. Like, um, so if you're not hitting for power, you're probably not driving guys around the base paths. You're probably not scoring. Andrew Vaughn hasn't really gone off yet. Um, we you know haven't... who I... I'm just looking at right now who's actually been pretty good. Uh, Gavin Sheets. Gavin Sheets up until today was actually the most recent White Sox hitter to hit a home run. And then and I he believe did hit a home run today, too. So it, as did Paul DeYoung, I believe. If I'm not mistaken. Uh, Gavin Sheets scored the only two runs in the second game of the doubleheader with a two run homer. OK, did DeYoung, did DeYoung hit a home run in the first game? Uh, he may have. Yes, he did. Oh, sorry. Okay. It was a solo home run. Uh, Dominic Fletcher had the other RBI. Oh, okay. But yeah, but Gavin Sheets has been good. Uh, 270 average, 391 OBP, 541 slug. Like, he has been a really good hitter so far. But one guy does not a lineup make. Like, when your big three are injured, you can't rely on Gavin Sheets to go and provide all of the runs every game and win. Like Paul DeYoung has been until today kind of really, really bad. Like he's, he's had been... a, he's had a couple home runs, but other than that, like I think most of his hits were those home runs up until like the last couple days. But I, I don't know. It's just it's been it's been rough to watch the White Sox hit. Now, I do want to talk about some of the positives of the White Sox, because there are some positives. I, to the I White have, Sox. I, I have the number one positive. Yes. Garrett Crochet. That is correct. That is exactly where I was going next. Reliever turn starter. Which doesn't always work out. But as ex- as exemplified by AJ Puck. And pretty much everyone else. Although AJ Puck was a starter turned reliever turned starter again. Uh, so, yeah. Um, but Garrett Crochet has pitched four games for the White Sox so far as a starter. Uh, 22 and two thirds innings. His ERA is 357. But as I mentioned kind of at the beginning of this whole segment, uh, Unearned runs have been a little bit of a problem for the White Sox so far. 
13 unearned runs through 18 games. And actually, it's I don't even know if there were, I don't know if there were any today. That was actually through 16 games. That number was. Uh, um, there was an error here. But yeah. So in the second game of the doubleheader today, the one run that Kansas City got was unearned. Okay. 14 unearned runs through 18 games. So there's been some issues in the defense that's been leading to some unnecessary scoring for the other clubs. Um, granted, that doesn't factor into ERA, but defensive range and things like that can, and that can kind of, those two can kind of go hand in hand. So Garrett Crochet's 357 ERA is actually kind of a, uh, a symptom of some of the defense behind him because he's pitching to a 232 FIP, which is amazing. He's striking out 35% of batters that he faces, and he's only walking 4%. Garrett Crochet is a legit starter. And I kind of, I didn't doubt him because, like, I, I didn't really, I thought that he probably should have been a starter already. I didn't know how it was going to go, but that's kind of more on the development that that club has been able to prove they can't do for years. Um, but, you know, so Garrett Crochet, clearly the number one positive for this club. He's holding batters to an opponent's batting average in the month of April. So in his three starts in April, an opponent's batting average of 167. So he's even when he's inducing contact it's getting it's they're actually playing pretty decently behind him so overall like Garrett Crochet I had no issues with him whatsoever I think he's really talked to himself and I think he he's always been a starter throughout his career except for when he got brought up by the White Sox to the major leagues and they just made him a reliever for the time being he's come up absolutely probably the brightest spot so far if you're a white Sox fan and just want something to grasp onto for the hope of your sanity now the white Sox did have two debuts for starting pitchers this week nick nastrini who in his first start in the majors uh went five innings on uh, i'm not seeing a pitch count um but i can probably five get innings, you two runs on three hits with five strikeouts so he did give up a homer um, but two runs in your debut game, that is not a bad start, especially against a team in Kansas City who has come out of the gates a swinging and swinging big. They've scored 92 runs this year. They are one of the highest scoring offenses in the major leagues um, so far. Uh, top 10, it looks like at least. So like that's a that's a tough lineup to get through. And to go five and only give up two runs, that's really impressive. So uh, I did get the pitch count for you. Uh, 74 pitches through five 74? Minutes. Okay, cool. Yeah. And on, uh, let's see. Was Jonathan Cannon, was his debut today? Because I think his debut was... I'm, not, I'm not seeing his line on B-Ref yet. Uh, let me pull that up for you. Yes, it Real was quick. today. Yes question was was it again, game one or game two against the whites uh, against the kansas city royals as well five innings one earned run on three hits with three games so hits. yeah that's that's actually really really positive signs i don't know much about either one of these guys i don't know where they were in the prospect rankings or anything like that um it looks I, like I do have, it, it looks like Nick Nostrini was the seventh uh, overall prospect in the organization. So, and and the Cannon was a 2022 third round pick. So both guys have been drafted here in the last couple of years. Nick Nostrini in 2021, but if these guys can develop and continue pitching like this, uh, th that will be a pretty pretty positive step for the White Sox. Getting Aloy back should help them score a few more runs once. Yo-Yo and um, uh, Luis Robert come back. So I can't believe I blanked on that. Uh, once Yo-Yo and Luis Robert come back, I do think that this lineup will be a bit more steady. 
So yeah, this is not a club that is at risk of going 20 and 142 or whatever people were saying they were on pace for. I saw um, that today and I was like, no, no. I mean, it, they might get 30. They might get 30. The, I, I won't lie. This could be a hundred loss season. I don't think it will be, but it could be. It'll be, it, yeah. it'll be a rough season, but it's not going to be this rough the whole time. It, it, it will get better. It, as, as hard as that seems to, like, that could seem to believe well, it, right now. It can't get worse. I think that's the, that's the silver lining. It cannot get worse. It, it could, but it would take a lot. <laughs> I mean, even a blind squirrel finds a nut, T-Rad. That is true. That is true. All right. So we have one more club that we need to touch on, and it is my favorite club to rant about. And I will probably be ranting here very shortly. That is the I, I, I fully Colorado it. Rockies. Oh, Dick Monfort. How do you continue to run this club in such a way that they can't figure out how to pitch and in one of the most hitter friendly parks in the majors they can't hit either how like the monforts have owned the club for 20 years how have you never thought huh these guys with big break that we've been trying to bring in that Really aren't all that good where they started before. How do you think that's going to work? The only guy that has ever worked here was 2018 Kyle Freeland, who threw fastball after fastball after fastball, and it worked. Now, Kyle Freeland has fallen off a cliff, and the other day, in a pinch running situation, tried to go home on a dropped third strike or a dropped. Uh, was it a pass ball, wild pitch? Something? I think it was a pass ball. He, I'm pretty he, sure it was a pass ball, yeah. He tried to score in a pass ball, ended up, like, getting landed on by the pitcher, and looked like he was going to be seriously hurt. Uh, as weird as it is to say, he might still be the best pitcher on the club. So putting your... Uh, Ryan Feltner probably is the best pitcher in the club, right? Yeah, Feltner's been doing really, really yeah. well. Okay. So your second I'm best gonna... pitcher on the club, putting him into pinch run and having that happen, you can't do that. Put in a reliever, yeah. have him run. I, I have my own thoughts about that whole situation. <laughs> uh, none of it is positive. But this, but... this Rockies club... I don't even know where to begin, man. Like Chris Bryant's hurt again, again with a, thing is, a back, he, with a back strain. I'm pretty sure he hurt that in Toronto. I wouldn't uh, be surprised. He went up against the wall and I think slammed into the wall and then just kind of disappeared. Yeah, I mean, but just like. Well, but looking at their lineup, like they did just sign Tovar to a big extension here right before the season. And I, how's he doing? I don't even know. Uh, not horrible. Okay, so Ezekiel Tovar is actually hitting pretty well. So Ezekiel Tovar is hitting 284, 347, 478 with three home runs. Um, pretty good defense there at shortstop. That is a bright spot for the Rockies. Nolan Jones, the guy who was the breakout star last year, has not been off to a great start. Uh, he is one of the worst qualified hitters at the moment, hitting 171 through 78 plate appearances. That is, uh, if you're someone who likes uh, numbers, uh, 12 hits in 78 plate appearances. 12 for 78. Um, he has one home run. And he is 61% worse than the average player or average hitter. Um, so when, you're, when your good hitter is not hitting, your superstar is hurt yet again. Your 
best pitcher is the guy that you have slotted in at number four. Your second best pitcher is getting hurt on slides because you've decided to pinch run with him. Like, the bullpen's not good. Like, I don't know... I don't know how to say anything positive about this club. And whenever I told Gautham this is what we were going to talk about, he's like, please just say something positive about each club. I think I'm going to have to go with Ezekiel Tovar. Um, so I, I was going to recommend um, making like a compliment sandwich, but I don't think the Colorado Rockies deserve two pieces of bread okay. for the sandwich. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Okay, I got this. Compliment sandwich. Ezekiel Tovar has been hitting really well, and that was actually probably a good extension that they had. Um, they're a terrible franchise with a terrible owner and a terrible front office, and I hate everything about it. Why do they put their fans through this every single year? Also, Britton Doyle has had a really good season so far. He's hitting 292, 333 with three home runs, and he plays a really, really good center field in that massive stadium. I'm going to give you a side of fries with this as well. Uh, Ryan McMahon. Is OK, what, th what kind of fries? Because not all fries are created equal. You would think that they are, but there are just some types of fries that are just awful. Are these bad ones or are these good ones? Well, Ryan McMahon's hitting 361. So, I mean, OK, so those are waffle fries. Yeah, like yeah, okay. with a 948 OPS, like. He's actually hitting pretty well. So it, it explains how they've hit 70 or drove in 70 runs as a club. Then that part makes sense. But this pitching staff is so bad. So remember when we said that uh, Feltner is currently the best pitcher on the team? Yeah. Uh, so he pitched today against the Philadelphia Phillies. Five and a third innings, nine hits, six runs all earned. Ugh. Brought his ERA up to 5.06. You want to hear Kyle Freeland's season line? Bad. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Ew. In four starts, Kyle Freeland has pitched 15.2 innings. He has given up a total of 23 earned runs. Gosh. Ew. 25 total if you count the unearned runs. Um, but he casually has a 13.21 ERA. But if you look at his FIP, it is significantly better at 6.31. That's not getting better. He's struck out 10% of batters and walked 10% of batters with a 50% ground ball rate, and he... Uh, I, you can't blame everything on the defense. Like, th there's a lot to blame on the defense here with that, that ERA, but you can't blame everything on the defense. If you're walking as many guys as you strike out, you really need to fix something. And it's also, like, it's not even all been in Colorado either. Because I'm pretty sure he, ex like, Freeland exploded against, I believe it was the Cubs. Uh, so. So there was his well, first start he, of the year. He exploded twice in Arizona. And there was his first start of the year against Arizona. In Chicago, seven runs. At home, two earned. Okay. And then at Toronto, four. So, like, he's he's getting better, I guess, but also maybe not now, even though it was his non-throwing shoulder that got injured. So, if you're looking for a silver lining on that, non-throwing shoulder, they said he's fine, he's expected to make his next start, we'll see how it goes. Well, and they dodged a bullet with that not being his throwing shoulder, because if that yeah. was your throwing shoulder, oh boy. And I know they challenged it, too, for a uh, blocking violation. And I was actually kind of surprised that that was upheld. Because it kind of looked like Freeland was already in. And they, they still called him out. And I was kind of surprised by it. But I was more surprised that they went with the blocking violation 
challenge, and then there was still like, and the call stands the runners out. So, so it was it stood. It wasn't confirmed. Yeah, it was it was just stood. Okay, but I was I was pretty sure he got in there, and I've I've umpired baseball games before, so I was like, hey, I'm smarter than the person in New York. But I do that all the time. The person in New York has more cameras, though. The person in New York was probably Angel Hernandez. No, he was actively at a game. Oh, are we sure? I think so. Is he ever, like, actively at a game? Yeah. Maybe physically. Physically, He may not be mentally at a game. He was physically at a game. (laughs) He, he He was not mentally at the game. All right, so I guess to wrap it all up, uh, these three clubs have had abysmal starts to the season. I don't think there's any any other way to say it. They've been bad. There is hope for a couple of these clubs. There is hope for the White Sox to improve over, uh, what, 200 winning percentage. Or one, one, whatever. I can't remember what, I can't do that math in my head. Um, there is hope in their good hitters coming back from injury and getting off to a good start. There is hope for the Marlins to see a resurgence of AJ Puck after the, um, or after his great spring rough start, Jesus Luzardo to bounce back and some of their guys to start hitting a bit better there. And Jake Berger, when he's back from injury, jazz Chisholm, like there's hope. Then there's the Rockies. Um, but as much as you want to think these are historically bad starts, which it kind of is for the White Sox, it's their worst start in franchise history. As far as major league history goes, this is very precedented. 44 teams since 1960 or since, uh, yeah, 1961 have started four and 14 or worse. 80 since 1900. Like it happens. Some of these clubs have made the postseason. One of them went all the way to the uh, league championship series. So, I mean, all is not lost, but there are some pretty big things that need to change for these clubs, both luck and personnel. And if you're the Marlins, you need to keep your good pitcher on the major league roster. Like if you're the White Sox, you just need someone that's not Jerry Reinsdorf. Yeah. Yeah. But that, that that's it. Like he, end of story. He's so bad he doesn't deserve a rant. If that lets you guys know how I feel about Jerry Reinsdorf, like I'll go off on Dick Bonfort, Bob Nutting, Castellini for the Reds. I'm not giving Jerry Reinsdorf the time of day. So, all right. Well, thank you very much for hanging out with us on this episode of Getaway Day. We will see you guys back on Thursday for this week in baseball. If you enjoy the podcast, please subscribe on your favorite podcasting app or YouTube to make sure you don't miss any future episodes. Join the conversation on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Getaway Day Pod. If you enjoy card collecting, check out our sister YouTube channel at Getaway Day Cards.